Would she have come to the USA and quit her job but for the fact that you had proposed and you were marrying her in June? I don't know because she got a visa cleared for doing exactly that. So the only reason she would come would be to marry me. And you also agree that she was running out of time on her K-1 visa, right? We are back on the record in the matter. Your next witness. I would call the defendant. Okay. Please, some of were affirmed. The testimony about to give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I'll be done. I do. Thank you. Counsel, you may proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Um, if you could turn to Exhibit H, please, in your uh, exhibit binder. Um, there's three here. Which uh, what am I it'll, it'll say defendants. defendants on the front. I think the oh, two okay. on the left are mine, and the two right. on the right is yours. Okay. H? H, please. Okay. Um, and looking at the Bates numbers, uh, in the bottom right, I want you to turn to Bates number 733. So three zeros and then 733. Okay. okay. Um, in the, at the bottom of where there's text, there's, is that your signature? Though? The last? Yeah. And uh, this is your acknowledgement of receipt of the financial statement and disclosure effective January 13, 2008, right? Right. And if you turn back three pages to page one of the financial disclosure, that's your handwriting, correct? Three pages? Yeah, so page number 730. Um, yes. That's your handwriting? Yeah. And again, your cousin uh, has been a lawyer in Pennsylvania. Okay, as of the date of marriage, your cousin has been a lawyer in Pennsylvania for how long? My cousin had been a lawyer? Um, yeah, geez. I don't know, probably. At least 15 years. At and least. his office was two blocks down from the apartment you were living in? Approximately. It was about an eight, ten minute walk. Okay. Um, on the same exhibit, Exhibit H, if you could turn to Bates number 734. Um, at the bottom of that page, um, that's your signature, dated... Um, I can't really tell if that's June 12, 2008. Yeah, that's my signature. Is that a 12 or is that a 13? Hmm, it's kind of sketchy, isn't it? It's, I can't tell, but uh, looking at the, the final signature on the page, that's hmm. signature? Yeah. Uh, and she acknowledged receipt of that financial statement on June 13, 2008, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you had bank accounts in your name at Bank of America, correct? At, the, at this time? Uh, yes. Um, and you had, you drove a Mercedes at that time, right? I drove a Mercedes, yes. It was on a lease. And you, um, you had accounts that you were a joint owner with 
either your mother or your mother and your brother, correct? Not to my knowledge. In uh, the volume two of um, my exhibits, mm -hmm. I'm going to have you turn to, I'm sorry, it's volume one, it's at the back of the volume. Uh, exhibit 32. Strike 32. Uh, we are in the second book. It's 39. statement dated uh, May 4, 2006. Do you see that? Okay, yeah. And it's an account that is in three names. Is that right? It is. Uh, and those names are... Uh, who's that? My mother. Uh, My brother. And... You know him. Is that you? Yes. Okay. Um, move to admit 39, Your Honor. Any objection to the admission? I don't have any objection, Your Honor. Uh, exhibit 39 is admitted. Um, if you turn to Exhibit 40. Um, this is a similar statement, but for account number ending in 4307. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. Uh, and again, you are a co-owner with on this account, correct? Um, according to this statement. Move to admit 40. Any objection? No, no, no objection. Uh, exhibit 40 is admitted. And um, if you can look at now at Exhibit um, 41, uh, this would be a more up-to-date statement for the account ending in 4307. Uh, is that fair to say? Um, Dated December 19, 2014 through January 16, 2015? Yeah, it appears to be, yeah. Move to admit 41. Any objection? No, nope, no objection. Right. Exhibit 41 is admitted. I have you turn to exhibit 43, please. Okay. Um, Looking at baits in the middle, because there's two sets of baits, there was a discovery baits and a trial baits. The one in the middle, uh, at the very bottom, I'm um, looking at uh, 00636. Do you see that? 00636, okay. Um, on the right hand side of the page, mm -hmm. Uh, I guess three quarters of the way down, there's um, three signatures. Uh, the first one, do you recognize to be your mother's signature? Yeah. Uh, the second one, do you recognize to be your brother's signature? Yes. Um, and the bottom uh, signature, that is your signature, correct? Yeah. And this is the signature card for account number 4301, is that right? Uh, it's uh, reference at the at the top on the right. Yeah. Um, that exhibit 
uh, Your Honor, is uh, it's a fairly sizable exhibit. Uh, it's got statements as far back as they would give them to us, or actually statements from the 2020 range, but the signature card was the primary reason for it. I don't know if the court wants to receive the entire thing or just states uh, 636. Okay, but you're saying that's really the limited focus of your Correct. use of the document. Correct. So I'd be inclined to narrow it to that page unless, Mr. Kelleher, do you say any need for it? I don't, I don't care. Okay, so uh, any objection to the admission of debate numbers 000636 of exhibit? Well, only two zeros. Well, respect, oh. the only question I have for my client, and I don't know if that needs to get all in, is the date that this account was actually opened. I think that might be important for the court to consider. Okay. Well, the, the, the signature card is dated May of 2007. But the account itself was opened on April 24th of 1991. Okay. So I, I wouldn't. Okay. So don't have is that reflected issue. on that page? Yes, Your Honor. It is okay, so I'm it's all I'll, on that page. I'll admit that that page of Exhibit 43, so we'll limit it to just that single page. So noted, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Um, have you turned to Exhibit 50? Um. Um, do you recall discussing um, Exhibit 50 with me at um, your deposition? Let me, let me get to it. I'm still trying to turn all those pages. Uh, this specific uh, page, I, I I don't. We could have. I don't uh, okay. recall. Uh, exactly. We'll talk about it for a second. Um, this was this is a, rep, a, a statement reflecting a loan taken out by you and your mother um, as of August of two thousand eight. Um, hmm. Do you recall discussing that now? Yeah. Um, if you could turn to Bates number 00978, which is the third page of the exhibit. Okay. Um, you were a co-applicant for this loan, and this was the loan application that you submitted, correct? Um, oh, applicant. Okay. Um, if, okay. Uh, turning to page 979, or Bates number 00979, which is the last page of the exhibit. Uh -huh. um, at the top, of that exhibit, um, there is collateral uh, listed as what appears to be two uh, FDDB uh, certificates, assuming okay. CDs. Do you see that at the very top? I see the uh, entry, yeah. Uh, one with a balance of 18470 and one with a balance of 37409 You see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then current assets. Um, you, there's listed two bank accounts at FDDB um, in your name and your mom's name, one with a balance of $80,000 and one with a balance of $17,548. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Move to admit. I don't have an objection, Ron. 50. Uh, so exhibit 50 okay. is admitted? All right, have you turned to Exhibit 51, please? Um, I will suggest to you that this is the actual loan agreement for the loan we just talked about at Exhibit 50, mm -hmm. um, reflecting the interest rate, uh, the truth in lending disclosure. If you could turn to Bates 
plaintiffs 00982. Um, 00982. Uh, okay. Uh, is that your signature midway down on the page? Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, move to admit 51. Any no objection? On. Exhibit 51 is admitted. Now, this loan was taken out roughly two months, what's it, June to July, July, August, just roughly two months after your marriage, right? Correct? Yes. Well, I don't know. Let's well, see. transaction, oh, transaction. Date, okay. August 18th, 2008. Okay. Um, so that, that it, am I, is my math right that you're roughly... Roughly, yes. Two months and four days from the date of your marriage? Yes. Okay, and I have you turn to Exhibit 52. Um, what do you, would you say 52? 52, 52, please. Uh, okay. um, this is a 1099 DIV form um, in the name of your mother and yourself. Do you see that? Yeah. Uh, and it's for the Wells Real Estate Investment Trust. Uh, do you recognize this as at least a document you reviewed during the course of this discovery in this case? I don't think we looked at this. Uh, I don't recall looking at this, but I, I, I see. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. It's a, it's a uh, 1099? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is my mom's 1099, I guess. But you see your name there, right? Well, the name is here, but this is my mom's. Uh, this She paid the tax. She got the dividend. It was her account. I never got a copy of this. This did not come to me. It's her address. And uh, I just, you know, want you to know that this is, you may have showed this to me. This is the first time I'm seeing it, ever in my life. Okay. Um, turning to exhibit... 50, oh, uh, move to admit 52, Your Honor. No objection. Exhibit 52 is admitted. Um, turning to Exhibit 53, uh, this is a statement from that Wells uh, Real Estate Investment Trust. Mm -hmm. um, confirmation cover, page 4. Uh, who who did it say that this page is for, or this statement is for? Uh, it's for... And is your name there as well? Yeah. And it says Wells, right next to the names, it says Wells, R-E-I-T, 2, joint, or J-T-T-E-N. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. And this is a statement to both of you, you and you, right? Well, it, it appears to be, but I, I want to reiterate that it's addressed to my mom and that I never saw it, never got it and uh, had no claim to it. I didn't even have knowledge of this account until after she passed away. And the reason my name's on this is because my mom was a pretty savvy money manager and she wanted to make sure her kids got her investment money without having to be subject to Pennsylvania state tax. Now, uh, if you could turn back to uh, Exhibit H in, in the defendant's exhibit okay. books. H, yeah. Oh. All right. All right. Um, on the very first page, um, which... Um, Um, so your base number three zeros seven two five. Do you see that? This is the first page. Yeah. Right there, uh, in the second full paragraph that starts this agreement, mm -hmm. it identifies your address of Dunmore, PA. You see that? Yeah. Okay. And just so I'm clear. This agreement is something you downloaded off the internet and printed? Well, it is, that's correct. And I and was residing. No further, there's no further question. 
just this is something you downloaded and printed off the internet, right? It is something I downloaded off. Okay. No, well, that part wasn't downloaded. I understand. Um, but that's what my driver's license had as my as my address. Um, if you could turn to Exhibit 54. Exhibit 54. Um, as of sometime in 2007, did you have an investment in National City Corporation's common stock? You know, I, uh, you had asked me about that, and I uh, looked all through my records, and I found uh, no, no link or record to that. So I can't really, uh, I can't really tell you about this. Now, I would have researched it further had I had access to my home and my records, but I have no access to my home. Uh, Your Honor, I don't think I moved fifty-three yet. Any objection to Exhibit 53? I don't have any objection. Exhibit 53 is admitted. Uh, also, no to admit 54. Any objection? I don't have any objection. Exhibit 54 is admitted. to the marriage, as is evidenced by some of your exhibits, uh, particularly when you weren't apart, you communicated via email, right? And phone. Tell me, speaking on the phone or text messages? Uh, it, we talked on the phone. Okay. Uh, but did you communicate via email? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm assuming you searched. Did you ever find any email communications in which you mentioned anything about a premarital agreement? To in the emails? Correct. No, I wouldn't have done that. Okay. And you have no documentary evidence of giving her the agreement on the 12th of June, right? Uh, documentary of, well, no, because we were living together and we can strike everything after the word no, Your Honor. And you don't have a witness here today that saw you give her the document on the 12th or any time prior to the 13th, right? No. And you agree that the week leading up to a wedding is kind of hectic, right? Normally. Okay, well didn't you testify that it was a very hectic time? The whole 90 days was a hectic time. That's what I was referring to. And you recall going to the jewelers uh, for the rain resizing issue on the 13th, right? I don't recall that. Okay. You recall going uh, for her to get a dress on the 13th? Uh, I don't. And the agreement was signed at your cousin's office. Um, do you agree that it was sometime around 4 or 5 o'clock on the 13th? Uh, it was in the afternoon sometime. It could have been earlier than that, but it was in the afternoon. And you agree that she quit her job in Ireland um, to marry you, right? She quit.
quit her job in Ireland uh, to come to the USA. Would she have come to the USA and quit her job but for the fact that you had proposed and you were marrying her in June? I don't know because she got a visa cleared for doing exactly that. So the only reason she would come would be to marry me. Because she was on a K-1 visa, right? Uh, we had gotten approval for the K-1 visa. We pursued that together. And you agree that she was pregnant uh, on June 13th, right? Um, yes, she was. Uh, and you agree that you told her that you would not be getting married on the 14th if she didn't sign the agreement, right? Yeah. I didn't say we wouldn't get married. I said we, we can't get married without a disagreement. And you also agree that she was running out of time on her K-1 visa, right? Um, it was within 10 days. Of the marriage? Uh, no, yeah, of the, of the of the marriage. Yeah. I pass the witness, Chairman. Thank you. I, I'm, can I get a time check, Your Honor? Because I'm gonna, it's going to be really tight, but I'm going to cut some questions down. Uh, you're starting. You're at 51 minutes. All right. Okay. Um, and how am I, Judge? You're at 48 minutes. All right. Let's can, talk. Can I grab my water? I, get, I just get dry here. Got one, one little, there. Yeah, got one little Take one of these. I promise it hasn't been tainted in any way. Uh, John, I would never <laughs> choose that. I actually had a party on the other side. Not, he, he only drank Perrier. Uh, and I got it just for this settlement conference, and he wouldn't drink mine because I was supplying. So that's why it's kind of funny. Well, might fellow answer. Pennsylvanians not going to do that. Eh? <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, uh, your first marriage. Uh, when, uh, how, when were you first married? I was married uh, August 6th, I think, 1973. Okay. okay. And how many children, and what was your wife's first name? Linda. Okay. And um, when did you get divorced from Linda? Um, January, take effect, uh, January 4th, 2006. Okay. And I'm not sure the marriage date was either 73 or 74, but it's a blank to me right now. But a law in Mac, 30 plus 33 Yeah, years. it's 33 years. All right. Now. So let's talk a little bit about that divorce. Um, and I'm just going to have to cut down some of the questions that wasn't mm -hmm. asked. But Go ahead. When did the divorce start? When was it first filed? Uh, it was first, It w we separated for okay. a, no a number of years. All right. And then... Um, it was 2003. It was around around June of 2003. Okay. It was fun. And um, let's go to Exhibit O. Stipulate the admissions. Uh, exhibit O is a separation agreement. Okay. okay. So okay. Exhibit O is admitted. And then if I could just get the same stipulation on Exhibit P, which is the actual divorce. Yep. So exhibit all in. Yeah, trying to save you some time. Okay, okay I'll, 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 I'll stipulate as you go to exhibits okay. that I don't have an issue with, right. just so you can save some time. So, I want to make sure. Like, how would you describe, um, you know, the the cost and the amount of information that was supplied between 2003 and 2006 when you guys did this separation agreement and divorce? Supplied to her. To um, no, no, no. Supplied to your first wife, Linda. Oh. Uh, so, let me strike it and ask a different way because I would have to. Just say that what you. How, how rigorous was that the request for oh, documents? No, for, well, it was, it was very thorough, very rigorous. It, it kind of got dragged out. There were periods where, you know, it, okay. there were some gaps and stuff. So we dragged out for quite a while. Okay, about three years total, right? Uh, so that would have been about two and a half years, right? Let, let me see. Probably around two and a half, I guess. Okay. All right. And let's go to, um, let's look, looking at your, uh, let's go to page three of your separation agreement. And the separation agreement was done the same time as the divorce, right? That's just what they call it. Yeah. All right. Who got the house? Um, Linda got the house. Okay. And did she get all the contents in the house? Yeah. 
um, going to page five, did you have to, uh, what kind of property did you have to sell um, during your divorce proceedings? Going to page five. Uh, where I talked about the real estate. Point seven, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, there was a, a house and a duplex on the property okay. in, in Phoenix. And what happened? It was a rental. So. Okay. Uh -huh. And what happened to it? I sold it to get raise money for my kids' tuition at college. Okay. And that, I'm going to get to that. My, so. my first, uh, my older child, not the one that I was paying for after. Okay. And then let's go to, um, did you have retirement accounts? Yes. Strike it. Did, did you also have IRA accounts, which are retirement accounts? Yes. Okay, I'd like you to go to page six. Yeah. And this lists all the different accounts that you, uh, retirement accounts that you had at that time. Is yes. That right? Okay, in 2006. Yeah. All right. And this shows how those were divided, who was getting what. Is that right? Uh, well, it shows, I don't know if it shows a division of each account, but I think it, it shows the accounts. And then it was done through Quadra. Okay. Right? Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So we actually quadrated one account, but we had the amounts come out. Right. I'm going to get to that. All right. Okay. And was that part of your agreement? It's a little leading, but was that part of your agreement that you're trying to figure out a way to, to have just the least amount of quadros done? Well, yeah, you keep it simple. Okay. As right. long as it balanced out. So were all of these accounts that are listed on page six and seven divided? Not physically necessarily, but the values. They went into the division. Okay. Um, did your wife any, have any credit cards, that being Linda at the time? Yes. Did you agree to anything regarding all the, of her credit card debt? Yeah, I took all the credit card debt. I'd like you to look at page 9 of your decree, which is based on 351. What, what, what's the paragraph? I'm just looking at the thing that says debts of the parties. Yeah. Okay. Um, it says the husband shall, it says except for those particular credit cards and other debts, the husband shall pay the wife the sum of $18,450 payable at the rate of 400 a month for the credit cards. Do you see that? Yeah. It also said that you pay off the balance of her Sears credit card for 1350 Yeah. Okay. Um, in this divorce in 2006, were there any missing accounts, any accounts that you were hiding, any accounts that you had in your back pocket in any way, or was, or did this decree take care of all of your accounts and assets uh, with you and Linda? Yeah, it took care of all the accounts. All right. Did you also agree to pay alimony as part of this um, agreement? Yeah, it let's was. Let's go to page. Um, let's go to page. Yeah. Um, Ten. And I'll just read it to you. It says, and then there's interlineation on here that looks like it was signed off by everybody. Do you see that? Yeah. All right. It says, commencing as the first day of January 20, 2006, the husband shall pay to wife during his lifetime until her death or remarriage, whichever shall occur first, the following sums as and for alimony. And it says 30% of his annual base earned income, currently 120000 per annum, and 10% of his annual gross earned commission, including advanced draws, commissions, or bonus income. You see all that? Yeah. Okay. And then did you do that throughout the marriage up until the time you retired? Yes. Okay. All right. Did you agree to do anything in terms of, in addition to the alimony and to, the, and to her getting the marital residence and all of the things in the marital residence, did you do anything in terms of paying for your daughter's college? Yes. I'd like you to go to page 13. And it says uh, on, on paragraph 7.1, except as set forth herein, husband shall be solely responsible to the extent he's financially able to do so to pay for the education costs of the parish child, including tuition, room, board, books, fees. See all that? Transportation costs. Yeah, her car through the completion of a four-year college degree, but not beyond the end of the school year, which attains the age of 23. Do you see that? Yes. Did you do that? Yes. Okay. So I want to make sure I got it all, all, all correct, like all your obligations. You had alimony obligation? Yes. You had an obligation to your daughter to pay for all of college, is that right? And expenses, full, yeah. And expenses. You took on uh, all the credit card debt, apparently, or almost all of it? Yes. Okay. And you gave her half of all the value in the various retirement accounts, which we can get to more in a second. Is that right? And a house. And a house, right? Okay. Yes. 
Sorry. Did you agree to anything, in addition to those things, did you agree to anything in regards to medical insurance for your wife and daughter? Yes. Okay, what did you agree to? Um, I, I think I uh, agreed to uh, continuing to okay. pay for just, that. As, on page 13, uh, paragraph 7.1 and 8.1 talks all about the medical insurance for your wife and for your daughter, right? Right. Okay. Just very, you know, briefly, I mean, how, how did this divorce from your wife, Linda, like, affect you emotionally, if at all? Um, emotionally. Well, you know, we had gone through the realization of breaking up you know, early, much earlier, but the financial impact was a, was a devastating effect. All right. Um, all right. And uh, without going through all the rigor and mo of how you guys met, um, you started dating in a serious way right away in 2004. She describes that correct? Yes. And you, um, and you guys took trips together? Yes, we did. And including to your mom's house? Yeah, we went to Scranton a number of times. We went to a, we did a, you know, weekend in the Poconos. We did a trip to Florida. All right. And I would assume, just tell me, how, how old was your mom in, in uh, you know, when she first met uh, When she first met so that would have been uh, 2004. Um, she would have probably been about 86. 86? Okay. And how old was she when you, you and she got married? Um, she was going to turn 90. She was 89, I guess. Okay. All right. And I'm assuming just, would, would you know, you know, if you and, and had not been serious, would you have brought her to, to visit your mom in 2004? Not, no, not, not, not like okay. that. No. All right. Okay. So what discussions, let me strike it. Did you have discussions with um, in 2004, 2005, and 2006 about your finances? Over that period of time, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. What kind of discussions would you have with in terms of your finances? Um, the challenges that I was having, you know, um, the, uh, you know, at, at that time, you know, leading up to the actual settlement, um, it didn't impact me anywhere near as much as after this document got produced. Okay. But, you know, I mean, it was two households. I was living in New York and I, supporting uh, a, a home in Connecticut with, you know, Linda and me. At some point, the two of you in 2006 started to live together and found an apartment together, is that right? Yeah. All right. What was her level of activity, if any, in regards to getting an apartment to live with and her together? Um, well, we talked a lot about it because we talked about what was practical, what we could get, what, what was affordable, um, you know, kind of minimum amount of, of room and stuff that we, we wanted. So, I mean, we talked about, I mean, what woman's not going to talk about where she's going to live, right, as far as the ambiance of it or whatever. But, so we, we screened some different things and, uh, and, and looked for probably two months okay. before we actually found a place. And we ended up in, uh, in Connecticut, okay. which was cheaper. All right. And um, moving from New York to Connecticut was uh, a, a budget decision. Is that right? Well, it was a budget decision and somewhat of, uh, you know, the quality of it was, okay. you know, it was kind of near the water. What so. discussions, if any, did you have about the budget for renting an apartment? But we talked about budget because when when she would make a suggestion or send me a listing or whatever, you know, I mean, it, it couldn't, I mean, because you could spend a ton of money uh, renting in New York City. No, I understand that. But yeah, I, yeah I, so I, you'd I, have to talk about the budget or okay. else you're wasting your time. All right. And did you tell her about the divorce? Did you guys talk about your divorce? And Yeah. Okay. Yes. She was well aware of the divorce. All right. And um, did she ever meet um, your ex-wife and your adult children? She did. Okay. Um, did she ever ask you any questions about your finances that you didn't answer? 
Um, no, I don't think so. She didn't ask a lot of questions, but, you know, yeah, I, I think I answered the questions. Okay. All right. And when did you take, when, why did you guys break up in 2006? And when was that that you broke up? We broke up, um, uh, <laughs> I guess it was July. Um, she returned, um, she returned, uh, I think, is, I think I drove her to the airport on July 31st, if I remember correctly. Okay. Who took her to the airport? I took her to the airport. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, after that. Um, where did you, did you move after you took her to the airport from, from uh, Connecticut? Yeah, so I had to, um, you know, move out of where I was. Um, I really didn't want... I wasn't going to run another place, certainly not there. So uh, I, uh, I asked Felinda if I could come by, come by and stay there for a little while and go through my stuff and see what I wanted and my personal belongings and everything. She's stuck in the garage. And uh, so I, I was there for probably two weeks. Okay. And then where did you go? And then I went to um, Scranton and lived with my mom. Okay. Why? Why did you go to Scranton and live with your mom? Because she wasn't going to charge me rent, uh, I shared a bed with my brother, okay. and I and it, it was strictly economics because I was, okay. I was pretty much broke. The only count, the only money that I had, was really not liquid. Okay, I'd like you to look at um, just very quickly if we look at Exhibit N. Recognize exhibit N. And just to let you know, we only have about 10 minutes or so or yeah. more, so I'm trying to pick up the pace, okay? Yeah. Um, do you recognize Yes, I, I, I do recognize the form. It's not completed, right? Okay. It's an I-134 uh, affidavit of support form. Yeah. Okay. Move for admission, Your Honor. Any objection? Oh, here, yeah, the first page is complete. Uh -huh. nice. okay. Exhibit N is admitted. All right. And then let's go to bait stamp 745. Yes. And is this um, an application that you filled out um, in terms of your income and submitted uh, to the U.S. government? Yeah. Okay. And at the bottom it says that your uh, income is $120,000 and that you have deposit in the savings bank of about 6500 and you have other personal property of about 25000 Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. And um, was that truthful and correct as to what you were earning? Um, at the time, that was that was probably that was right on. Yeah. Okay. And was she aware of this document and your income? Um, to my to my knowledge, yes, um, because um, I think just about everything that I submitted, I copied her. Whether she read it or not, I don't know. But this form was necessary for you to come yes. to the United States. Okay. Yes. Was she active in trying to come to the United States? Was she uh, was she proactive in filling out paperwork and other things? The things that were required, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, the prenuptial agreement, which is Exhibit uh, H. So let's go there real quick. Okay. When we go to Exhibit H, let's go to the very last page, which is bait stamp 734. Okay. Right. And at the top of the page, what's the date of this document? June 12th. June 12th, 2008. Okay. Did you, um, did you complete this document on June 12th, 2008? Yeah. All right. Um, tell me when you first mentioned or talked about, to, about having a prenuptial agreement. Um. Well, I talked about the, uh, the background and the issues and the divorce and what it did and it broke us up and I, you know, I mean it was, that, that was a conversation, topic of conversation for a while. And even, even in Ireland, but um, 
but I would say a couple of weeks before, it got to be more focused on, um, you know, protection of assets. Okay. Um, let's talk about this form. How did you get this form um, and the prenuptial agreement? How did you get it? I got it from the Internet. Okay. And do you know what source specifically, or do you recall? I don't recall the source. I know that I looked at a couple and tried to find the most credible, and it was specific to where we were in Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, when did you print the form off? Um, it was the, the 12th. Okay. And um, on the 12th, what discussions, if any, did you have with the document? Um, on the 12th, I said, um, you know, this is the agreement that is, you know, sets the protection of the assets, and um, you should read it over, read it, because tomorrow, you know, we'll go down and we'll get it signed, we'll get it notarized. Okay. So. And did you hand her um, your exhibit uh, on the very last page that shows all the ass your assets and debts? Yeah, but it wasn't signed. Okay. No, I understand, but did you give her that document at that time? Yeah. All right. Did you discuss um, leaving the alimony provision open? Um, I, I don't know if that, I don't recall if that was really, a, you know, became a topic of conversation, but, um, but I, you know, I, I, I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in protecting my assets. Okay. All right. Um, when you gave it to her on the, on the 12th, what complaints, if any, did she make about the document? Um, she didn't complain about it. Okay. Uh, what indication, if any, did she make that she couldn't understand it or needed more time? She didn't say that. Um, how would you describe her English back in 2008 when she signed it? Her English was impressive and very good since the time I met her. And, um, you know, she interpreted, we had, she had full Polish friends and roommates and all the things, and she was always interpreting both ways. She, she, her English was always very good. I mean, not just for somebody who immigrated, but for, in general, I don't think most people her age talk that well. Let's say, uh, and it was signed on the 13th, is that right? Uh, yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about that. When, um, what complaints, if any, did she make on the 13th about signing the document? She didn't complain. Okay. Did she in any way, well, I mean, I'm just asking, had she complained to you and said, I, I need a lawyer, I need more time, I'm not going to sign the document, what would you have done? Also for speculation, objection. Well, it being his knowledge. Actually asking him to testify as to what he might have done if something happened 16 years ago. Well, years ago. You, a better foundation needs to be laid to, to examine that aspect. On its face, it does ask for speculation, but um, you would need to lay a foundation as... as well, let me ask it this way. Um, arrived in March of 2020, I'm sorry, 2008, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But you guys didn't get married until much later. We had 90 days, so we got we got married 10 days before. The okay, days. right. And, and what I'm asking you is, um, you had testified that you had discussed a prenup, or the idea of a prenup, mm -hmm. prior to the, uh, the 12th uh, of June. Is that right? Yeah. All right. At any time, what objections did she raise about signing a prenuptial agreement? She, she, she didn't raise objections. Okay. Um, did you guys converse every single day? No. About that? No, about anything. Oh, yeah, every day we were together. Okay. And you lived together, is that right? Yes. All right. And, um, okay. Would there have been any issue, had there been a complaint, with you rescheduling the marriage for a couple of days later or even a week later? No. I mean, the planning was minimal, so, it, it, you know, I thought about that. It could have been changed. Okay. But as you 
sign this agreement, in your mind, there were no issues? No, no issues. And nothing was brought to your attention of any kind of problem with signing the agreement? No. Okay. Let's talk a little bit. One of the things that's being alleged is that you had accounts that apparently you were hiding or otherwise. So I just want to go through um, the disclosure here. Um, go to Bates Stamp 734, it should be in front of you. 734? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. At the bottom, it has at the very bottom a personal loan. To is your mom for $32,345.34, yeah. which you listed. Mm -hmm. What was it? What was that one for? That was money that uh, um, I had I had invested in some speculative ho housing uh, in Florida through, you know, a friend that was doing it. And uh, actually, um, aware of it because I talked to her about it and and it started to go south. I had it for a while because it was pre-construction and then as the economy, if you remember the great financial crisis when real estate fell apart, so did that initiative. And I had put um, uh, I, I think I ended up putting a total of like $80,000 but I, I had money in it that I had borrowed from my mom. All right. Um, and you saw earlier, like, reference when I was asking your wife about her letter, or her emails regarding uh, the property problems. Do you call that? Regarding, I'm sorry. Regarding the, this real estate issue. Uh huh, yeah. Okay. Was that the same real estate? Yes. Okay. You discussed that with her about this losing proposition on the spec houses? Yeah, yeah, because it was like, the market was getting soft, and it was like, do you want to do you want to make the commitment? Because the first down payment, the first deposit was just you, you got you reserve a place, and the next payment was we're starting construction. We need you to put another ten percent or something. Let me ask you this: Are there looking at this document seven three four? Are there any assets or debts? Let me back up. Was the Mercedes an asset? Did you get to keep the Mercedes? No, it was a liability. Okay. It was uh, a lease, and the lease was coming up in like a month or two. Okay. So there's no equity in the, in the Mercedes? There was no equity. We got rid of it. We turned it back. Okay. And then you listed here element 115, the partnership, and your exact equity in it. Is that right? Uh, this was the equity as far as you could, I could determine. In the percentage? Uh, the percentage was accurate. Okay. But the equity was, uh, you know, an estimate from uh, the principal based on... It was a private company. It was a small company. It was, you know, there was just a handful of guys in this. Right. Okay. Um, were there any accounts that you had that are not listed on this document? Yeah. There were the two uh, Bank of America accounts. Okay. And let's talk. What were those bank accounts? They were ones of checking and ones of savings. Okay. And why did you not list... Um, the Bank of America checking or savings, why is that not on this list? Well, I mean, part of it was uh, just, you know, uh, an oversight. And, and secondly, it, they were, I didn't consider them assets because they were really transactional accounts. So the checking account is, I had to have an account where my paycheck came into, bonuses came into, they transferred in, right? And then if the money was, uh, if there was extra money, I'd move it to the savings to hold it so I didn't see it, so I could have some money when I needed it, and then I'd move it back into the checking account. But the checking account, I had auto pay on bills, bills, you know, okay. rents and utilities and uh, lease payments and all that stuff. So it was very transactional. All right. Let's go um, to Exhibit Z. And by the way, um, let's go, yeah, go to Exhibit Z. Yeah. Do you recognize Exhibit Z? Yeah. What is it? It's a statement. It's a bank statement from Bank of America on, okay. a, on a checking account. This is a checking account? Yeah. All right. And what's the date? Of, what's the date through? It's um, June 11, 2008. Okay. That's the end date? That's the end date. Okay. And 
Let's go to the next page, which is base stamp one nine nine three. Yeah. And what's the ending balance on six eleven zero eight? Four thousand three hundred thirty seven dollars fifty six cents. Okay. Did you um, add name to this account after you got married? Yes. Uh, when? Um. You know, maybe February. Okay. Were you hiding the account? No. Okay. Move for admission of Exhibit Z. No objection. Exhibit Z is admitted. Okay. And just to make it clear, you you were paying all of your household expenses, all expenses out of this account. Yes. All right. And so I have it clear. You're getting a salary, and the salary comes in, and then you have all these alimony, mortgage payments, all that are being paid out. Yeah. Month after month. Every month. Okay. And looking at this document, uh, which is Exhibit H, going to bait stamp 725, so let's just go to 725. Okay. Uh, I'm here. By the way, were you under the impression that uh, read the document, had read the premarital agreement? Uh, I was under the impression she had because uh, she had it the night before, and when we went to um, the notary, um, the notary kind of uh, asked about that. Okay. All right. Jack should move the strike here, say. Well, let me, I'm just asking. Sustained. I'm just asking, um, as a result of your meeting with the notary, did you reach a conclusion without telling anything anyone said? Objection foundation. Sustained. All right, let's go to paragraph three. Here it says, the parties have furnished each other with a financial statement, but each party acknowledges a full and complete disclosure substantially of all the real and personal property now owned by him or her and agree that the values are an estimate by him or her of the approximate present value of property. See that? Yeah. And it says, all property listed is now and shall continue to be separate properties in the respective parties. You see that? Yes. All right. So. You're asked about these other, about your mom's accounts. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, and this a, a, a litany of accounts that your mom is on, you're on, and your brother is on. Did you have access to any of those accounts? I didn't know about the accounts. Okay. I mean, I knew where she banked, but I didn't, she didn't consult with me so on investment, so I, don't, I didn't know. My okay. brother was take, took that role because he lived with her all the time. And when your mom died, who was the executor of that? State. Uh, my brother was the executor. Okay. And when did you actually receive um, documents and files from your mom from the state? Um, she passed away January 9th, 2015. I went back for the funeral and for the certain, you know, and the follow up. So it would have been around, you know, the third week, you know, January 20th, the 22nd, 20, somewhere in there. I think, you know, I got, I got to see that stuff. Okay. Um, were you receiving, on uh, you know, a few of these accounts that you were that were they listed one account which was a UGMA account? Let me strike it. Some of these exhibits they're showing you look like bank accounts of Fidelity. Right. Were you getting any of the tax documents from those? No. Did you pay? And have you supplied your tax returns for every year going back to 2006 until the 2021? Yes. All right. This land investment trust, did you get any money from that? Like, like were you part of that deal other than having your name on it? The Wells? Yeah, the yeah. Wells thing. Uh, only after my mom passed away. Okay. No, I understand that after she passed away, you inherited something. Yeah, like but, but before that, no, I, I wasn't even aware of it. My mom was a pretty astute investor. Okay. Even when she was older. And how, uh, how old was she when she passed? She was 98. Did your mom ever have discussions about you about money strike? In terms of uh, Exhibit J. Let's go to Exhibit J. Yeah. What is Exhibit J? Uh, it's an email. Okay. And who's it from? 
And uh, when was it written? Uh, January 6, 2005. Okay, and what is it? Uh, it's a, a poem. That okay. You... It's a love poem? More or less, yeah. Okay. Move for admission to exhibit um, J. No objection. Exhibit J is admitted. And that uh, document's in English, is that right? Yes. All right. Um, okay. During the marriage, um, did you purchase some homes um, during the marriage or Yes. So? Okay. And um, did she sign grant bargain sale deeds to those homes? Uh, yes. Okay. There was one very small number. I. I to go to other doctors, where um, there was a UGMA account in one of your daughter's names that they're saying uh, wasn't disclosed. Did, did you have any money in a UGMA? And if you did, was it your money? There was uh, a balance, I think, of uh, around five or six dollars. Okay. Total. All right. And it was in a uh, uh, an account that I had opened for my daughter. It was it was her account? I was the what do you call it? The guardian? What is the term? Well, custodian. Pardon? Custodian. Custodian, custodian. Right. yeah. And, and I didn't bring up a UGME account in my case, Chief. So. Oh, sorry, well, it was in the pretrial. Okay. So, start with that. Okay. so, and there was some reference to like saving bonds, that there were savings bonds with your name on it. Tell me about like what, what's, tell me about the savings bonds. So, after my mom passed, um, we went to the safety deposit box she had at, uh, at Fidelity Bank. Fidelity Deposit and Discount Bank. It was in Dunmore down the street. It, you know, it's a community bank type thing. But that was her bank. She did have uh, a box, and in there were um, the certificates, the uh, bond, uh, what do you call them, bond, uh, savings bonds. Okay. So there were U.S. savings bonds that she had bought over 20 years ago because they had actually matured and stopped paying interest. Okay. And so some were in her and my, my brother's name, and some were in her and my name. Okay. And so that was the first that I saw those, we, and, and we, we had those bonds, so we, we, we cashed them in and uh, put them in savings. Okay. Were you 100% as honest as you thought you could be in terms of that disclosure that she was provided? That she was provided? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I... I, I uh, I mean, I've been in business. I know the importance of doing ethical contracts. And this was, you know, this, uh, if I thought my mom's accounts would have were my assets and I needed to go ask her about them, I would have. But I didn't even know about them. I mean, I know she had money, and I figured that she's going to will it to her kids. That's the only place they'll go. But I didn't know they were in our name. Um, do you have an understanding that if the court upholds the prenuptial agreement, um, let me start, are you asking the court to uphold a prenuptial agreement in this case? I am. Okay. And um, and do you want to have an understanding that the court can still order alimony as part of its decision in this case? I understand that. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. All right. Any? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> uh, do you turn back to Exhibit H? The last page you were looking at, Mr. Kelleher? Yeah. Um, in the liability section... What page are you on? The last page. Oh, the last page? Okay. What's the base Page number? 734. Okay. This is Exhibit H? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, seven line items down in the liability section you have... Linda, $8,150. Mm -hmm. What was that for? You know, um, off the top of my head right now, I, I'm not sure, but I would I would say I'm 90% that I was probably behind on alimony payments with her. Uh, but you also, you had an alimony obligation of 30% of your gross income, correct? 30% uh, of my base salary. 
which was $120,000 at the time. No, it wasn't that. Um, I was with Element 115. My base salary was 72000 And I had made 120, I think, or 100 and anywhere between, I don't know, 120, 130, whatever it came out. Because the rest was variable. It was based on my sales commissions and bonuses. And, um, and it was 10% of the, of the incentive. So it was a little complex. But looking at the actual document you just referenced during direct examination, mm -hmm. the alimony provision is 30 year or 30 percent of its annual gross base earned income from employment, currently at twelve one hundred twenty thousand dollars per annum. That well, says it right there in the agreement, right? Yeah. So when that I, I'm just asking you if that's what the provision says. at the time that that was dated, that's true. Um, it didn't last. And it was a lifetime obligation to your wife, right? To Linda? It was a, whatever it says there, whatever the wording is. To me, it was as long as I worked. Because once I stopped working, there's nothing to pay. But it says during his lifetime, until her death or remarriage. Okay. You were aware that that was a long-term obligation. It was a long-term obligation. How many years of alimony did you actually pay your ex-wife? Um, from 2006 till... Um, um, about April of 2021. So 14 and a half years ish? Whatever that is, yeah. Okay. And that's nowhere listed on page 734 uh, of the prenup, right? Exhibit H? As, the alimony obligation? Um, well, there's an entry there for Linda. Right, but the annual amount that you expected to have to pay isn't listed there anywhere, right? It doesn't say it's annual liability. Um, the dating app, uh, DreamMates, um, when you filled out your information, the profile upon which you relied, were you honest about your age? Not totally, no. And when you say not totally, uh, you misrepresented your age by 12 years, right? Oh, I don't know if it was 12 years. It may have, it may have been 10. I, 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 I don't remember exactly, but if you say it's 12, then I'll say I'll, I'll go along with that. And you, during the times you saw her, you know, translate between friends from English, Polish, etc., you never saw her translate a legal document, right? A contract, right? Never had the issue to do that. Never had the issue. And Your Honor, uh, I'm going to have you turn to Exhibit uh, 60 real quick. Okay. All right. Um, this is a uh, notice to you as of January of 2015 from First Clearing LLC. Um, that is one of the accounts, um, well actually, this is a name address verification form. Uh, and if you look at the bottom, uh, the old information it lists as mm -hmm. and the joint tenants with right of survivorship. Then the new information is or deceased and joint tenants with writers of survivorship. You see that? I do. And that would have been a notice that you got after your mom's passing, I'm assuming? I don't know. I mean, this, uh, 2015, this is, this is done in 2015, so, right? Is that, yeah, is that yeah. right? Yeah, January 2000. When did your mom die? She died January 9th, 2015. And so, this is dated January 21, 2015. Does yeah, that seem all right. Like so I don't know if I actually received this document because um, I didn't live there. You know, I, 2015, where the hell was I? Uh, I wasn't there. Uh, I, you know, I didn't reside there. As a matter of fact, my, I don't think my brother, well, yeah, he probably did. But I don't. I don't know if I if I ever saw that. But what is the so? What's the what is the question about this? I'm just document? asking. This is a notice you received of the change in account status from just a straight joint tenancy account with your mom mm -hmm. to a account 
with your deceased mom. Okay. Um, so and if we go back, if we spent the time, yeah. not that I don't, not that I'm out of time, but we spent the time to go back and look at the first fidelity or the fidelity statements, you'd see uh, regular payments from First Clearing LLC into the fidelity accounts. Is the only reason I'm I'm referencing this and moving into evidence 60 yeah, is okay. to show this account paying into the account statements that I've already put. In, into my mom's accounts, and that's Correct. the way she did it. She had all of her accounts set up like that. Move to admit 60. Any uh, objection? I don't have any objection, Your Honor. Uh, but I actually have one question before you a minute, or is that? Go, go ahead. You, do you desire to board or the? Well, I just had a I, I'm done. So if he wants to do redirect on that. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, you have no further questions. Yeah, I have no further questions. Okay, so okay. if you want to follow up on that. Um, when, when your mom passed away, um, who was the executor? My brother. Okay. And you had lived in um, you had lived in Nevada for many years prior to 2015, right? Yeah, I, we, that's true. We came out in 2010. So from 2010, we were in Nevada. All right. So when this new address uh, is being sent out to you, um, as your account at the Dunmore, Pennsylvania, like you have no idea if that was done automatically. Do you have any idea whether First Clearing Inc. just did it automatically or whether your brother was involved in it? Do you know? My brother may have been involved in it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's the only thing they're changing, not changing the address, they're just changing the way it's registered. Okay. All right. So I don't know who would do that or why. Okay. All right. No further questions, Ron. All right. Uh, you may step down. Uh, any other witnesses? No. Okay. Um, and no other witnesses on the defense side? No, you're on. You, you have exhausted your time. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I, I will allow, given the fact that we're we're done a little bit early, I will allow closing statements if you desire to make a brief you closing statement. You sometimes not allow? Well, it, I, I, sometimes I, I question the utility of it. I, and and I, I, I don't uh, disagree with you in many circumstances, Your Honor, but I would like to uh, have a very brief closing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we, I know that you know that we're operating off of Pennsylvania law as far as the interpretation and or assessment of validity. Uh, and while you've heard, you know, the general statement that you know Pennsylvania law is very favorable to the person uh, advocating for the uh, premarital agreement. You still have to look at the case law where it talks about procedural fairness. Simeone, uh, I can give you the sites, 525 PA 30, uh, Pareco, 5, 571 PA 61. Uh, Hamilton goes into things such as the rest is eliminated by the opportunity to consult with a lawyer. Uh, that's 591. Well, uh, let me just follow up. Just a point. brief question. I know Simeone was cited by both of you in your mm -hmm. pretrial memos. I, were these other cases also cited? In I, I'm not sure they okay. were. Uh, they were just ones that as I was preparing um, for okay. this and pre-writing my closing argument, uh, I, I, I well, apart went from back Simeone, and reflected can you, upon Can you them. give me the other sites that you've referenced? Other um, than Simeone, for I know. For Pareco, it's 571 PA 61. 571 PA 61. Okay. And Hamilton versus Hamilton 591 A2D 720. And that deals more with the issue of duress, which to me, Judge, you know, we, I understand the uh, attempt to argue that uh, even though I'm a joint tenant with right of survivorship on accounts that I signed the um, signature card for, that somehow I didn't know I was joint tenants, uh, I understand that argument. Uh, I don't think it necessarily uh, is dispositive of whether the disclosure is appropriate because we know from the loan document two months after that he was listing collateral of, of joint accounts with his mother that were nowhere near his disclosure on the prenup. Now, again, when you add up the, per the actual dollars that are reflected in that loan application and in the statements that have been admitted as evidence, the percentage of net worth not disclosed is significant. And, this, and again, these aren't pay on death accounts with his mother. These are joint tenancy accounts with his mother. Okay? 
Um, you, you don't have his basic bank accounts, and I understand they're operational accounts. They still need to be disclosed. And I think the biggest issue on disclosure is the failure to disclose the amount of alimony and the, you know, it's probably the single largest debt he had. You know, roughly thirty to forty thousand dollars a year for life, plus potentially more if he had incentives and, and, um, uh, and, and you know, uh, commissions. But that's just one issue is the disclosure issue because the one thing the prenup also doesn't have is a waiver of further disclosure. That's not contained anywhere in the prenup. That's been admitted in evidence as Exhibit One and Exhibit H. But this case primarily rests, while that's problematic, this case rests on an issue of, of procedural fairness, of duress, of voluntariness. And we know, and that's why you know, the Hamilton uh, case was cited, because we know generally prenuptial agreements throughout the country, if you have the opportunity to consult with a lawyer, or if you do consult with a lawyer, the idea of voluntariness or duress kind of disappears. And it's real simple to either have a lawyer prepare a pre-instructional agreement, particularly when your cousin's a lawyer living down the street, um, who could easily refer you to uh, a lawyer who can prepare a proper prenuptial agreement, uh, and certainly the ability to refer to a lawyer to have it reviewed. He has legal he has lawyers in his family, and he chooses, you know, whether you decide that you're going to buy that on the evening of the 12th, he brought up uh, and gave her a draft of the agreement. The 12th would have been a Thursday. The wedding was on a Saturday. The document was signed in the late afternoon, early evening of Friday. Okay. The concept that she could have, A, hired a lawyer or gotten an appointment with a lawyer before the wedding to actually have it explained to her, it's just, it's, it would be impossible, even if he gave it to her on the 12th. Uh, however, we know from the document itself that the acknowledgement of receipt of the financial information was the day it was signed. Each, each party said, yeah, I got this on the 13th. It's right there in black and white. So, the thought that he gave her the information the day, on the 12th and he acknowledged and she acknowledged the fact that it was received on the 13th I think is far more supportive of mom's position that it was sprung on her on the day of her marriage while she's getting her ring size, buying a dress and getting her nails done, or the day before the marriage, when she's buying a dress, getting her nails done and having the ring size. Okay. He said he didn't remember that part of the day. She testified very clearly as to how the day went, what happened, and how they went from doing these things for the wedding to him stopping by the apartment and coming out with the agreement. You heard no testimony that refuted that testimony on the part. But when you look at the circumstances, I don't know that the 12th versus the 13th is, is the, the breakwater for whether or not a pregnant woman who just quit her job for the purposes of this marriage and whose visa expires in nine or ten days being told two days before the wedding or one day before the wedding when there certainly isn't enough time to have someone explain what it means or go to a lawyer you didn't hear him testify that he explained to her what it meant you didn't hear him testify that he went through it and said yeah this means that this remains mine, and you can't make claims in this regard. You didn't hear any of that, because it never happened. I'm sure if it happened, he would have said that happened. But when you talk about what is duress, what is voluntariness, not having a lawyer automatically calls into question, particularly, again, when he's got lawyers in his family, and he just testified that there are a bunch of law firms two blocks down the street from the apartment. Okay? You have... The threat that they can't get married without it, and you have a window of <coughs> nine or ten days before her visa expires. You have her unemployed, so if she says, no, I'm not going to sign this, or raises an objection, she's not married and she has no job. And you have someone who's 
pregnant, four and a half months pregnant, I think that's 19 weeks, something close to four and a half months, who would have to continue a, pre a pregnancy without being married, despite the plans that were made clearly to get married, uh, to satisfy the requirements of the K-1 visa, and move forward. Either one of the three things, the fear of being unemployed, the fear of, A, not getting married because she was in love, the fear of not um, being able to maintain a residence in the United States and satisfy the requirements of immigration, and the fear that um, she, you know, she was pregnant. These are all absolute. Either one of them is a basis for the court to find there was no way that she could have voluntarily executed this agreement. And when you think about how easy it would have been to get an appointment with a lawyer for her, to have a lawyer drafted. I mean, this is printed with check boxes. I mean, it's it's barely a premarital agreement. But when you consider how it was presented to her, you need to sign this or we can't get married, and you consider all the factors and the timeline of what happened on Friday, and this being signed at the end of the week, at, you know, on, on Friday night or Friday late afternoon, 4 or 5 o'clock, and the testimony which, I'm sorry, my client didn't lie about her age on a dating site, so you know, while you talk about credibility and the like, um, it is it's problematic that he actually would believe that she would have the opportunity to voluntarily sign this document. Because there would be no way someone in her position would say, I'm going to jeopardize this wedding date. Who would do that to, to lose their immigration status for the pregnancy and be unemployed? Not married and unemployed was not part of the plan. Part of the plan was unemployed and married and having a baby. So how could you ever raise a complaint? How could you ever, as someone who English is your second language, no evidence that she has any understanding of what these words mean or that it was ever explained to her, he didn't explain it to her. He didn't have a lawyer explain it to her. And we, I went through a list of, of uh, specific words from the prenuptial agreement that she had no understanding of. Even today, she doesn't understand what the words in the premarital agreement are. And whether she worked as an au pair with English-speaking people or in Ireland on an assembly line with English and Polish-speaking people, doesn't allow them to establish she had any understanding of what she was waiving. And that goes to the fundamental procedural uh, you know, fairness that Pennsylvania addresses as its primary consideration. It's not quite as concerned about the same types of things Nevada is concerned about in its case law and its statute, but it is concerned throughout the case law on procedural fairness. And whether you went with the 12th or the 13th, of first getting it, although again, the document speaks for itself, that she got the disclosure the day it was signed. And when she told the story of finishing with her nails, and he's saying, well, we have to go by the apartment, and him coming out with the agreement, and then them driving down to his cousin's law office, she didn't, he didn't refute that. That is uncontroverted evidence as to how it all went down. And based upon that fact, as to how it went down and the circumstances she was in, I don't know how the court could find that she wasn't under duress or that this could have been executed voluntarily, particularly when you know how easy it would have been to satisfy those obligations. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. um, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, uh, thank the court and, and um, Thank the court for its time in this case, and we appreciate you giving us some extra time. Um, the prenup has been fought with basically a, a shotgun approach of throwing everything up against the wall. First off, I want to talk about the Simeon case, which has been cited by both parties and which is in the pretrial. That's very important, Your Honor, because here are the facts of the Simeon case, and they're undisputed. 
It's the seminal case in 1990 in Pennsylvania, and it's the only annotated case under their premarital act, which, by the way, has no unconscionability uh, provision. It's completely devoid of that. What it, here are the facts of that case. You had a 38-year-old neurosurgeon who, at that time, in 1988 uh, or 85, was earning $90,000 a year, who uh, was engaged to a 23-year-old unemployed nurse. The night before the wedding, the night before the wedding, his attorney uh, approached with him and said, you need to sign this prenup agreement, or we're not getting married. There was some dispute about uh, whether he said that or didn't say that, but it really doesn't matter. And her argument, to set it aside, was I didn't have the same arguments. I didn't have an attorney. I didn't understand. Um, I don't think it's fair. And the court was very, very clear Right? That, and you can read this right in the Samoan case, we cited to you, that if it says that you read it and you understood it, then as far as Pennsylvania is concerned, you read it and you understood it, period. And I'm going to give you another case, Your Honor. I, I brought it with me. And if I may just approach, I'm going to give counsel the other side uh, um, a copy. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes, you may. And it is the case of Paroli um, versus Paroli. And this is a, a, another 2005 Supreme Court case in Pennsylvania. And I just want to read a little of the facts, because what the facts were is this was a post-marital divorce decree. And the woman was trying to set it aside, the wife was trying to set it aside, said, hey, look, this, this post-marital agreement slash divorce decree doesn't put any values on the property. And after the divorce was over, um, he was represented by counsel and I was not, and then he sold the property for more than what um, he represented to me the value was. And here's, here's what the, the Pennsylvania court said. We begin our analysis with the seminal case of Simone versus Simone. Now, this is 2006 that we're talking about. Sorry, 2005. Wherein our Supreme Court analyzed the enforceability of a prenuptial agreement and clarified the standards for determining the validity of marital settlement agreements generally. Under Simone, we are not permitted to review the reasonableness of a marital settlement agreement to determine its validity, and the fact that the parties did not have separate representation is not relevant. The case abolished um, the prior paternalistic approaches to enforcing such agreements and announced absent fraud misrepresentation, or duress, spouses should be bound by the terms of their agreements. So let's just talk a little bit about that, Your Honor. First off, if you had a problem with the agreement, then you have to give some, you have to raise your hand, right? You have to raise your hand and say, hey, I don't understand the agreement. Her testimony, right, is I didn't, I've never read the, any of these documents that I signed for grant bargain sale deeds, right? I've never read any of those. Um, I've never asked anybody to read them to me. I don't understand them in any way now that she's claiming here we are in 2022, 20, uh, but those were signed in, back in 2015. She didn't tell anyone she didn't understand the prenup. She didn't ask to talk to a lawyer in any way, shape, or form. Um, she admits that she didn't make a complaint about signing the prenuptial agreement. She admits that she never told anyone that she didn't understand the prenuptial agreement. And she never told anyone that she didn't tell anyone she needed help with English, which is sort of a, a strange argument because on the one hand they're arguing that her English would somehow be deficient. I think there's a lot of evidence that her English was certainly well above average. But what difference does it make if you didn't bother to read the document or tell anyone that you weren't reading the document or look at it in any way? And I'd ask you to look at that Simone case because it was the night before he had a lawyer, she didn't. There's an age difference. There's a, a financial difference at the time. The court went on in this case because it's very important that the court realize this is that they said that um, it's also important to bear in mind, this is the Parley case, is whether adequate disclosure has been made depends on the facts and circumstances of individual cases because their argument is, well, you had some accounts apparently that appeared in your mom's name, right? That, and look, Your Honor, it wasn't his money, right? He didn't act like it was his money. His mother didn't act like it was money. His brother didn't act like it was his brother's money or my client's money. It was the mother's money. And when you look at the divorce decree that took three years in Connecticut, right? 
that, that divorce decree was the subject of three years of litigation before they reached an agreement and put all those things on there. None of those things are, are listed because none of those things belong to them in any way, shape, or form. None of them. They're not on his tax returns. Right? He's not declaring income on it. Yes, he inherited when his mom passed away um, in her late 90s. I think she was 98. When she passed away, he inherited those accounts long after the, 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 you know, the parties reached this agreement. I'd ask the court to consider this, Your Honor is that in the idea of duress, I'd ask the court to look at the Lewis case. It's in our pretrial. The reason this is very important is the Lewis case is, is a case in Pennsylvania that's not from the Supreme Court. It's from the appellate court in Pennsylvania. And it says, in that case, it was the only one. It's a 2020 case, and we cited it to your honor. It's the only case that they've ever found duress in Pennsylvania. And it, talk, it goes through a long litany. I'm pregnant. One of the cases they cite to, the person was pregnant and wanted to get married or not good enough for duress. Um, I didn't have a full disclosure, even though it says it's a full disclosure. Not enough for duress. And it goes down through a litany. And it says, very specifically, that after an, exec, that after an exhaustive review, this court has never found one case where the Supreme Court had found um, duress to exist. In that one case in 2020, they had facts totally different than this. In that case, in a post-marital um, agreement, so it was a divorce decree, he had her hospitalized in a mental hospital. And he told her that she would never, which she admitted to, that he would never let her see the kids again. And he was forcing medication upon her in this mental um, hospital. And also abusing a temporary protective order where he would invite her over to the house and when she would appear, he would file an order to show cause and call the police to show up. In that one case, in all the jurisprudence, going back to 1990, that's the only case they ever found it. One case. And very respectfully, if you read the Parley case, Your Honor, it talks about the fact that, here's what it says. Distilled, the case law provides that where the circumstances indicate that a spouse has knowledge of the general value of the couple's assets, an agreement will be upheld especially whereas here the agreement recites that full and fair disclosure was made. Several places in this prenuptial agreement, which I, I would dispute, Your Honor, that it's some trash document. First of all, it's, it's not unfair. Um, this was a second marriage with a guy who's 59 years old and had significant financial obligations, which we believe the evidence shows um, that she knew all about. Very respectfully, the only thing it was missing was one checking account for four grand, which we provide you the statement of it. If you look at that, uh, that list, he did a fair, full disclosure, and she had a good idea. I'm going to end with this, Your Honor. They've done a good job, or attempt to do a good job, uh, we'll say a good job, of trying to move the court away from what the burdens are here. The burden under Pennsylvania law is they have to show, or she has to show, by clear and convincing evidence, the highest standard in a civil case the highest standard that, and it's not throw everything up there and it's like, oh, it just seems like, uh, you know, so, somewhere in that penumbra of things we're complaining about is clear and convincing. No, there's no clear and convincing evidence of duress, none. No complaint was made. She understood English. She acknowledged that she understood what she was signing. She signed the document and said she waived an attorney. Um, it left alimony open to her and there was a good and fair and adequate disclosure of his assets and debts, which they said was, um, an estimate in any case. As to the other issue, Your Honor, that somehow um, somehow the prenuptial agreement itself fails because of the disclosure, again, you have to prove it by clear and convincing evidence that there was some massive amount of things here that weren't disclosed. Certainly, um, what was produced here would in no way suggest that he wasn't completely honest with, uh, with his uh, documents and that he wasn't completely honest with his debts and assets. There was also a third complaint that's been made that rises and comes back and it seems to, it's kind of ephemeral. The argument is that she didn't know what he earned. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to make it really clear. There's no case in Pennsylvania anywhere that says that it's a requirement to put down what your earnings are. None. None. Zero. But he obviously was submitting things to the federal government on her behalf and with her. And I guess you'll have to look at the testimony and say, well, look, 
either you're going to say that they were doing this hand in hand. I mean, obviously he was helping her with some of the writing. She would write it, and then he would uh, put it into more, uh, you know, business-like terms, right? <coughs> She knew what he was earning, and if she didn't know, she could have asked. She knew there was a budget for the apartment. I mean, who wouldn't know that? So, but respectfully, even if it's not in there, and it's not, we admit that, there's absolutely no case to support that, that by clear and convincing evidence that you should include it. No case whatsoever. So respectfully, Your Honor, we're asking that you find this prenuptial agreement to be fully enforceable under Pennsylvania law, that they fail to prove by clear and convincing evidence the highest burden um, in a civil case that uh, anything untoward here occurred that would rise to the level of set it aside with the understanding that the court can order um, alimony. All right. Um, I, I will be taking the matter under advisement as, as a, uh, counsel probably both expected and anticipated. Um, the, uh, there are a number of ex exhibits, obviously, that have been admitted that, that merit the court's review, and, and uh, I do both, both sides have referenced cases that may not have been included as part of your pretrial memorandums. And because this is a, a, uh, a, a law or a case that is governed by Pennsylvania law, it is incumbent upon me to make sure I, I review what you've referenced. So that's one reason I asked for the citations. Um, uh, so it will be under advisement. Now, <laughs> here's the issue in terms of timing. I know we talked about the May, I think it's May 11th. Right using that for financial issues, well, that's just a little over a month away. And I, I can't promise you, and, and that's the challenge. Obviously, right. that trial will hinge on my decision regarding well, sure. the premarital agreement. So uh, I, I wish I could commit that I would have that to you within 30 days. But even if it is within 30 days, that really doesn't give you time to prepare. Yeah, it doesn't give us time to finish our depositions of either right. party on the issues that we didn't cover in the right. initial deposition. Well, and, and I was about to say that uh, in relative comparison with Connecticut, we're operating at lightning speed in terms of finishing the <laughs> divorce. We are. Uh, but but in, on that note, I, that date needs right. to be pushed We probably out. do have to move it. We, we believe that we have an agreement on the custody. Yeah, I mean, so we could, we've agreed to joint legal, joint physical. There's some nuanced language regarding the oldest boy we got to work on. Um, okay. But that issue... Which is probably, you know, which has to be resolved before the finances anyway, will be gone regardless of what date we use. Okay. So, so we would we are fine to vacate that date, Ron. If we could maybe if you would leave it off for a status check as to the custody and um, order, just so we have it in. Like, well, yeah, having it on. Well, but it's a trial date for him. Oh, he sorry. probably wants to give it away. Well, oh, no, no. I just wanted a status check. I don't need to have. Well, I, I could certainly look for a date around that time frame to just set a status check regarding finalizing the language for. Custody and, and my hope is I have this decision done by that time, right? Uh, because obviously that at that point then we can talk about how much time you need to prepare for trial, right. and then also you'd be able to address um, potentially like alimony. We have to have it done before the court can address alimony anyway, right? Correct. Um, so I, I'm looking at. Um, We'll set a status check on looking at, at May 16th at 11. You can check calendars. And you usually have trial dates okay. that are not that far around the corner, right? I, I mean, it, it's, say, do you want to pick one now sometime in July? I, I'm, I'm happy to look for a date. What do you think, Joy? Well, maybe we could just do that. Um, I'm I can firm time. up a date with the understanding when we come back on that date if you feel like we need to move it. I mean, my, my dates are not, they're not too far out by compare, from what I'm hearing, but I will tell you, and, and because you're very active in civil domestic, the more resources are taken away from civil domestic, and you see that, the, the, more, uh, the more pressure is put on our calendars, including mine. I, it used to be that, yeah, easily I could give you a, day, a date. 90, within 90 days. Well, would it be okay, Your Honor? I, I, I'm out of town. It happens to be the one time, like that day you just gave us, I'm going to be out of town. Could we just have it like an on cap, like a calendar where, you, where we're not actually having a hearing, but you would just have put it on your chambers calendar? Chambers calendar for that date. And then 
I could talk to Mr. Jones before that and see what your calendar looks like and, and see if we can coordinate the trial. I'm, I'm fine with that. That'd be great. I mean, that's yeah. some, somewhat that's fine with of a reminder. I mean, I could use the uh, the May. My ch chamber calendars are typically on Fridays, so May 12th, the day after. Okay. We'll vacate yeah. the, the trial on the 11th. We'll place this on my chamber calendar on the 12th. So will you give the court some notification about Yes. Yeah, the, yeah, the sure. status of, of custody. Yeah, my guess is you'll have a, a parent assigned parenting plan probably in the next two or three weeks. Okay. You want me to look for a trial date? We'll back? just wait if that's okay. Ryan, and and I'm, I'm fine with that. I, yeah, I, I mean, maybe. Oh, I mean, you're, let me put it this way. We're, I'm not anticipating you're looking at the end of the year, for right. example. Yeah. I, I still anticipate this case is going to be done under the one year mark, okay. uh, which is. The unwritten rule. To, that's the goal. That's the goal. The aspirational goal. The, it, it is aspirational, right, uh, but it's getting tougher and tougher as they take resources and assign them to dependency and delinquency, and we lose civil domestic resources. So we're back to 2013 staffing levels There's for cars, civil domestic. Those cars, juvenile delinquents, they so, ruin everything. So. <laughs> All right, I appreciate your appearances uh, and the. Thank you, Judge. The work that and endeavor that was put into this afternoon's trial. I'll take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision. Thank you. Thank you.